Hello, we're glad you joined us for today's webinar, Prefrontal Control of Learned Fear and Avoidance. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the, le the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. To learn more, visit labroots.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button found at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report the problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Gregory Quirk, PhD, adjunct professor, University of Puerto Rico. Raised in Southern Connecticut, Quirk went to Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois for his graduate under, for his undergraduate training. One of the first NU students to major in neuroscience, he worked in the laboratory of Dr. Ari Rottenberg studying dentate granule cells in the hippocampus and memory. He then pursued a PhD in neural and behavioral science at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York, working with doctors Robert U. Mueller, mentor, John L. Kuby, and James B. Rank, studying place cells in the hippocampus and interrenal cortex. This was followed by a Fulbright Fellowship to establish the first neuroscience research laboratory in Honduras at UNAH Tegucigala focused on malnutrition and developing CNS. Following a postdoctoral fellowship at NYU in the laboratory of Dr. Joseph Ledo, studying cortico amygdala circuits in acquisition and extinction of conditioned fear, Cork then returned to Latin America in 1997 to establish his own research laboratory at Ponce School of Medicine, now Ponce Health Sciences University in Puerto Rico. In 2007, he moved his lab to the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine in San Juan. Over the past 20 years, Cork's research program on fear learning has brought competitive research grants, high profile publications, and first class training opportunities for undergraduate and doctoral students living in Puerto Rico. Dr. Cork will now begin his presentation. The floor is all yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, I am Gregory Quirk, and I'm happy to be here at Lab Roots um, uh, lecture on a prefrontal control of learned fear and avoidance. I'm starting with a beautiful picture of Puerto Rico, where I am. That's not my office, unfortunately. I wish it was. It's a small island off the coast of Puerto Rico called Cayo Santiago, which is a research uh, macaque research facility that, uh, for research mechanics, uh, and we do some research there. Okay, I'd like to start with this uh, quote from Marie Curie, the, the first woman Nobel laureate. Nothing in life is to be feared, it's only to be understood. That's very, uh, very encouraging, um, but it also in a way is, is an, an, a, an introduction for cortical regulation of fear or cognitive therapy. 
in a sense, can we think down our fears? Can we control them with our thoughts? So what makes us afraid? Uh, some fears are thought to be innate, like snakes, for example, or the fear of heights. This is the, uh, the CN Tower in Toronto, where you're supposed to walk across a glass floor. And it really is terrifying. Um, I went to do it myself and had real trouble getting across that floor because my amygdala is saying I'm, I'm going to die, but my prefrontal cortex is saying, no, uh, they don't kill tourists, and you're probably going to be fine. So I did make it across. But most fears are learned through conditioning or instruction. So how do we respond to, to dangerous stimuli? And we can respond either passively, such as freezing or startling, or actively, um, such as avoidance or, or fight or flight. Now these conditioned fear responses that occur with the trauma can later trigger um, anxiety and fear. And this is a feature of all the anxiety disorders. So post-traumatic stress, um, phobias, panic disorder, and even obsessive compulsive disorder. So the questions of our lab are, what regulates the retrieval and expression of these learned fear responses? And how do the fear responses compete with appetitive drives? So let's start with these passive uh, fear responses of freezing. So this video shows rats here in Puerto Rico, they're pressing a bar for food and they're receiving a pellet in a tray and they've, they're waiting for the tone. Okay, that, that light that just turned on indicates the tone and the tone means nothing to them so they, it don't, they don't stop eating. Now in the conditioning phase, the tone is on, it will terminate with a mild shock. Okay, there it is. We do that a few times, and the next day, this is their first presentation of the tone. And that's freezing. In a sense, we've inserted the memory of tone shock in the animal's brain and you can see the rat on the lower right is trying to break through his fear to get closer to the food, which is typical of anxiety uh, disorders that they prevent us from achieving goals. So we can measure this freezing with, uh, with video programs. It increases uh, during the conditioning phase. Then we give the tone without the shock and the freezing decreases and extinguishes. Uh, and then the next day, you can see there's a memory for fear extinction for the animals that had the extinguished memory. Now, the extinction doesn't erase the original learning. Um, if you just wait a matter of time, you can see that the, the extinguished freezing comes back, in this case, to its full original value over a number of days. This is called spontaneous recovery. So this suggests that the, the fear memories are regulated. So what are the circuits that regulate the expression and extinction of these, of these fear memories? So obviously the amygdala is the key structure here. It gets inputs from the thalamus and the cortex, gets tone and shock information that's integrated in the amygdala, the lateral and basal nuclei, and it's really the central nucleus that's the output of the amygdala to mediate the various aspects of conditioned fear uh, to the hypothalamus and midbrain. Now, the prefrontal cortex has reciprocal connections with the amygdala and really can control um, the output of the amygdala. And we're gonna focus on these two subdivisions of the prefrontal cortex of the rat, the prelimbic and the infralimbic areas. And we can ask, what do these areas do by infusing a, the GABA receptor agonist, mucimol, to inactivate these areas? So when we do that in the prelimbic cortex, the animals have trouble expressing or showing their conditioned fear. So, uh, but they have no trouble extinguishing, as you can see. If we inactivate the inflammatory cortex, in contrast, the expression of the conditioned fear is normal, but they have trouble extinguishing. They extinguish much more slowly. And the next day they show no memory of the extinction. So the, the, we think this prelimbic area is important for the retrieval or the expression of the conditioned fear, whereas this infralimbic area is important for the extinction. Now, the PL and IL areas project different, different parts of the amygdala, the prelimbic 
to the basal nucleus, mostly in the infralimbic, to these intercalated neurons that inhibit amygdala output. And this has led to circuits such as this that are thought to be involved in the expression and extinction of conditioned fear uh, from prelimbic cortex to the basal amygdala or from the infralimbic cortex to the inter intercalated cells to turn off fear. Now we've been recently revisiting these circuits with optogenetic techniques. So here in optogenetics, we can use either channel adopsin, express channel adopsin or halo adopsin, which is activated by laser light to allow the, the flow of, of either sodium or chloride ions to activate or inhibit neurons. And we use a CAM kinase 2 promoter. So these are the neurons that express these rhodopsins are gonna be the most likely projection cells or, or excitatory neurons. So for example, the prelimbic projects to the basal lateral amygdala, as I said, but it also projects to the thalamus, the midline thalamus, the uh, mediodorsal and paraventricular area. And then that projects to the central nucleus of the amygdala. So this is an indirect circuit in which the prefrontal cortex can control the expression of fear. This shows the antigrade label in the central nucleus with injections in the paraventricular thalamus. So to address these, these indirect projections, um, we used optogenetics. Fabrizio Del Monte, a, a, a postdoc in the lab, uh, used optogenetic techniques to express, in this case, um, uh, halorhodopsin in the prelimbic cortex. So you can see the prelimbic um, region expression of the, of the uh, yellow fluorescent, fluorescent protein that indicates halorhodopsin there. And when we shine the laser, yellow laser light, the action potentials are reduced. Now, we, the, the beauty of optogenetics is you can also activate just the terminals or, or inhibit just the terminals here. So we can express the halorhodopsin in the prelimbic cortex and shine the light in the terminals in the thalamus that receive the inputs from the prelimbic cortex, paraventricular thalamus. In this case, we're recording from the paraventricular neurons and we shine the light and, and inhibit the prelimbic inputs, we get inhibition, as you see on the left, uh, or on the right, we get excitation, suggesting that there's some sort of feed-forward inhibition of this, uh, of this pathway. So now the question is, what do these pathways, are these pathways necessary for the retrieval of the fear? What role do they play? So to address this, uh, Fabricio and the lab use halorhodopsin in rats at two different time points after conditioning, either six hours or seven days. And he noticed that when he inhibited the prelimic cortex, freezing was reduced at both time points. However, when he inactivated the projections to the amygdala, freezing was reduced only at the early time point, six hours, but not at the seven day time point. When he inactivated the projections from prelimic to the paraventricular thalamus, he saw the opposite result. The freezing was reduced only at the long time point, but not the short. Then when he inactivated the projections from the paraventricular thalamus to the amygdala, he got the same pattern, a, a reduction of freezing at the long time point, but not the short. And looking the next day, you can see here that the, the freezing is still reduced, even in the absence of the, um, of the laser light, suggesting that activation of these pathways may be important for maintaining the fear of memory. But it certainly seems like there's a, 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 a shift from the projections to the basolateral amygdala to the projections to the thalamus, a time-dependent shift in the circuits that, that mediate the retrieval of fear. Now, some implications of these findings are that it changes the way we think about the current models of fear regulation, which are based mostly on these 24-hour time points that the memories are changing or evolving with time. And post-traumatic stress is, uh, usually involves older memories. So it asks, is, is this time-dependent shifting uh, of retrieval circuits involved? And could it, be, could it be used clinically? And what are the mechanisms of this recruitment of this thalamic area? And what are the advantages? So the paraventricular thalamus receives inputs from a number of different areas throughout the, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the midbrain, and the, uh, the amygdala. 
and it returns projections back to many of these structures. So it has a unique connectivity, and it could be doing all of these things that have been suggested by, by various authors. It could coordinate the fear memory with other responses, such as arousal and anxiety, chronic stress, or food seeking and reward via its projections to the nucleus accumbens. And this is the, 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 um, the hypothesis that we're following up on now. So here we modified the task so that the animal can press a bar for food. It only gets the food if a light is turned on. So we condition the animals to press only when the cue light is on and not when the light is off. Then on day four, we either give the, the food again with the light as normal, or we omit the food so they don't get the food that they expected. Now we can activate with channel rhodopsin the paraventricular neurons. And when we do that, we see that it reduces the uh, pressing for food, both when the food is available and when the food is omitted, as you can see here on day four and day five. And I think we have a video of that here. So you'll see a rat, the laser is off in these trials. The rat is waiting for the light to turn on, and then it starts pressing the bar for food. Now, the halorhodopsin light is going to be turned on, the laser will be turned on when the light is turned on. Only in the, in the left-hand rat, the right is a control. And you can see that with this, act, with this uh, pathway activated with channelrhodopsin, the animal is not pressing for food on the left, where it is on the right. So this pathway turns off the uh, food-seeking behavior. Now we can do the reverse. We can in inhibit or silence this pathway by expressing halorhodopsin in the paraventricular nucleus and then a shining light in the nucleus, laser, yellow laser in the nucleus accumbens. And we do that, we get a very interesting pattern of results. When the food is available, we get no effect of inactivating this pathway. However, when the food is omitted, the press rate increases only when the food is omitted. So that suggests that under normal conditions, this pathway is recruited under the conditions where the animal doesn't get something that it wanted or these what we think are maybe somewhat aversive conditions. So for example, we think that this paraventricular thalamus could come online to coordinate food seeking with aversive events. So for example, if a, if a cat, which is a predator, per rat appears, then the, the prelimbic cortex can activate paraventricular thalamic neurons that then project to the central nucleus and trigger these fear responses. But at the same time, it can activate paraventricular neurons that project to the nucleus of common shell and decrease food seeking. So the animal can decrease food seeking and orient towards the predator and uh, escape. Now, let's take a shift and talk about the active fear responses of, or avoidance. Avoidance can be thought of something as positive because it really can be considered a coping strategy that reduces the likelihood of danger. But it also can be seen as something negative. It's excessive in anxiety disorders and it uh, interferes with, with goals and reduces the opportunities for naturally occurring extinction. Obviously, if the, if this, the a patient is avoiding the stimulus associated with the trauma, it will not learn that that stimulus is now safe. So we've modified our, our fear conditioning task by inserting a barrier at the opposite end of the cage where the animal can jump on and avoid the shock. We call this platform mediated avoidance. This a type of avoidance has a cost because uh, it competes with the food. When the animal is sitting on the platform, it can't reach the, the bar. So we think this is similar to clinical avoidance. And unlike freezing, this is really a decision that the animal has to make that can be based on multiple factors, such as the food timing and fear. So it's going to be more complex than, than fear conditioning, which is a more reflexive response. And therefore, they have a more complex circuitry than Pavlovian fear conditioning. However, 
we're in a position now that we know so much about the circuitry of, of fear condition to use it to understand avoidance, even though avoidance is a, a long history of research. Uh, now we're at a time we can really return to understanding the circuits of avoidance with clarity. Okay, here is a, a video of rats that have been trained in this avoidance task, they're pressing the bar for food and the light will come on, the tone will come on in a moment. There's the tone. Now they know the shock occurs at the end of the tone. But they don't waste much time getting on that platform and waiting out the tone. Now look at the rats in the, in the lower lower half. You see they're trying to get close to the bar. You can see that that tension, that conflict. Okay, now the tone is off and they can um, head back to the bar and continue pressing for food. Okay, so this is the work of Christian Bravo Rivera, and he was a graduate student in the lab. And basically this shows that we train the rats over nine or 10 days in this task. The blue line shows the increase of, in avoidance, and the red line shows the decrease in freezing to the tone. As you, so if this typical avoidance task is the animal learns to avoidance, to, 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 that it has control, it no longer is afraid of the tone. And the green line shows the rate of pressing during the intertrial interval which was depressed initially, but then comes back to normal levels. So here at the end, after 10 days, uh, the animal looks quite normal as long as it can do its avoidance. The question then is, what are the structures that are necessary for expression of that avoidance? So we started with mucimol in either of these three structures, the prelimbic cortex, the ventral striatum, or the basolateral amygdala. And to our surprise, in activating any of these areas, or all these areas, a decreased avoidance. But not in the same way. If you look at freezing, inactivating the basolateral amygdala also reduced freezing, whereas inactivating the prelimbic and the striatum did not reduce freezing. So we think that the inactivation of BLA reduced or eliminated the tone shock association, and that's why avoidance was, was lost. Whereas these areas, loss of uh, Inactivation produced a loss of the avoidance response, and the animal reverts to freezing. So we think it's really this projection that is mediating the avoidance option, or the avoidance response, under uh, these conditions of danger. So on the left, you have the circuits of fear conditioning, the prelimbic can activate the amygdala to, to drive freezing. But on the right, we think that the, the, during avoidance, the prelimbic activates the ventral striatum to generate the avoidance response. And we think this is a direct projection. Here we can combine CFOS, which is an activity marker, with retrograde tracers, retrograde labeling, injected in either ventral striatum or the basolateral amygdala. So you can see uh, here the, the cells that are labeled, uh, labeled in green are neurons that are expressing FOS and animals that are expressing the avoidance. You can see in the prelimbic cortex. And these, the same area tends to be, I, a label with cells that project to the ventral striatum, but not so much cells that project to the uh, basolateral amygdala. So indeed, shown on the far right, you can see that the, there are, the cells that are activated by FOS are tend to project to the ventral striatum rather than to the amygdala. So again, we can use optogenetics um, to investigate this. And this is the work of Maria Deal, a postdoc in the lab. What she did was express halorod actually arteriodopsin in the prelimbic cortex to inhibit or silence the prelimbic neurons. So she can inhibit or, or silence the, the response of these cells as shown here in anesthetized animals. But then in behavior she expresses the arteriodopsin in the either in the prelimbic cortex, both the rostral prelimbic and the caudal prelimbic. But in both cases, inactivating the cells had no effect. And you can see here in, um, on, the, on day 11 when the tone is, is on, there is no effect, uh, there's no reduction in the time spent on the platform. The animals still are still avoiding. 
both in the rostral prelimbic and in the caudal prelimbic. So this is a puzzle because our mucimol data suggested that there was an effect, was a reduction in avoidance. So uh, why is there a disagreement between the mucimol silencing or inhibiting and the arthrodopsin silencing? So to address this, we thought, well, let's, let's look and see what the prelimbic neurons are actually doing. Do they signal the avoidance? So to do this, Maria implanted animals and recorded from prelimbic neurons in the animals as they hear the tone and then start the avoidance. And she recorded across a, a large range of rostral and caudal prelimbic cortex. And you can see on the bottom that she saw both excitatory and inhibitory responses, cells that either were excited to the tone or inhibited to the tone. But when you look at the percentage of animals that, that showed this, the percentage of, 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 of cells that show these responses, it's about uh, equivalent levels show excitation versus inhibition in rats that, had, that were trained in avoidance. But in naive rats that were never trained, they're in the chamber with the platform and a bar, but they're not conditioned at all, uh, you get the same percentage of, of excitation, but very little or no avoidance, uh, uh, no inhibition. So that suggests that the, it's really the inhibitory responses that are correlated with avoidance, not the excitatory responses. And you can see that, and furthermore, the majority of these inhibitory, these cells that were inhibited are located in the rostral prelimbic cortex, not the caudal. So how could we block this inhibitory response to find out is it necessary for avoidance? So we used optogenetics again we can use channel rhodopsin to, to stimulate these neurons. Now, the neurons that are showing the inhibition are shown on the left as blue dots in a, uh, against a background of previous data from our laboratory looking at spike width and basal firing rates. So the small gray triangles indicate projection, putative projection neurons with, with long spike widths and, uh, and uh, slow firing rates whereas these uh, light gray cells are putative inhibitory interneurons, which have the uh, high firing rates and low spike width. So it looks like these cells showing inhibition are indeed projection neurons. And on the right, you can see the average inhibitory response. It lasts about 10 seconds or a little bit more, and it drops the firing rate from an average of six hertz to about two hertz. So, Shown here, cells firing at about six hertz, the tone comes on, it drops its rate to two hertz. But we can use channel adoption to stimulate the neurons at the tone onset at four hertz, which can bring the rate back up to six hertz, in a sense, maintaining the basal firing rate throughout the tone. Then we asked if this would affect avoidance. Okay, and what you're seeing here is the same rat without the laser on the left and with the laser on the right. There's the tone with, at this very slow 4 hertz stimulation. So you see the animal with the laser, it's, it's not pressing the bar for food, so it's, it's not like there's no fear. It knows there's a problem, but it's not using the platform. Then the tone goes off and it goes back to depressing. So looking at the data here, the group data, indeed, you can see that there was a there was a inhibition of the avoidance response with this four hertz stimulation of the cells in the rostral prelimbic cortex, but not in the caudal prelimbic cortex in agreement with the location of the inhibitory neurons, uh, the, the, the inhibited neurons were in the rostral prelimbic cortex. Furthermore, um, stimulation at two hertz uh, had no effect. So it's specific to the frequency of four hertz. So it seems that an inhibitory signal is important uh, in the rostral prelimbic cortex. It gets tone information from the amygdala, there, it, it, there's uh, convergence with other inputs to produce inhibition. And then this then perhaps disinhibits striatal neurons that are involved in avoidance. Um, 
Perhaps the, uh, like other cortical areas, the rostral pulmonary cortex can end on fast spiking interneurons in the ventral striatum, which can then inhibit uh, medium spiny neurons. Okay, what about extinction of avoidance? Well, um, we showed some years ago that the infralimbic cortex is involved. Again, with Musimol, we inactivate the infralimbic cortex just prior to extinction. The animals extinguish their avoidance, but the next day they show no evidence of the, ex of the extinction memory. In other words, they're unable to consolidate or retain that memory. Interestingly, on day 12, even though they have excess avoidance, they do not have excess freezing. So they're not more afraid of the, of the tone. They just uh, do, can't stop doing the avoidance. Now, a more uh, recent work done by Luis Rosas Vidal, an MD PhD student in the laboratory, um, has looked at the role of brain derived neurotrophic factor in, in infralimbic cortex. So when we inhibit or use an antibody to BDNF and we inhibit BDNF in the infralimbic cortex, it also impairs avoidance, uh, extinction memory. As you can see here, the animals are uh, uh, responding as if they had not had extinction. Furthermore, what he did was to combine immunocytochemistry for BDNF protein together with retrograde tracers injected into <clears throat> the uh, infralimbic cortex. So here's the hippocampus. Hippocampal neurons are shown uh, here. Red are hippocampal neurons that projected the infralimbic cortex. And those that are yellow are those neurons that they also express brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And indeed, after extinction training, those double-labeled neurons increased, suggesting that the input from the hippocampus is the one that's bringing this BDNF input that's important for extinction. And in agreement with that, uh, we've been using the CRISPR-Cas9 system to block the production of pro-BDNF in the ventral hippocampus. And indeed, when that's done, we get the same effect that the animals can extinguish, but again, their memory for the extinction is, is blocked, suggesting that the, um, again, the BDNF in the ventral hippocampal input is important for avoidance extinction. And it's important to remember that brain-derived neurotrophic factor is implicated in, in PTSD and OCD. The levels are, are reduced. So this could be uh, part of the mechanism for uh, these uh, accelerated uh, avoidance in this disorders. Now, some other directions in this avoidance tech we've been using is to maximize the food fear conflict. In the, in the videos I've shown you so far, the animals know that uh, when the tone comes on, they're on the platform, they can't press for food. But they know that when the tone goes off, they can go back to the uh, bar and, and press in the intertone interval. So we modified the task so that they could only press, they could only retrieve food during the tone. So this is the work of, of Hector Barbara Rivera, a graduate student in the lab. What he did was first condition the animals in the avoidance task so that they're avoiding quite a bit, and they're showing very little bar pressing uh, to the, uh, to the, to the bar, very little bar pressing during the tone. Then after that conditioning, he then conditions the animals to do uh, a, a, the light reward conditioning. So in this case, they, when the light turns on, that's when the, the, the bar is armed and they're able to get food. So they learn to increase their pressing uh, in the presence of the light. Then he gives both the tone and the light at the same time. That's the conflict. So the animal has, can only press for food during the tone. What do they do? So the animals show an interesting, most of the animals show this interesting property where they tend to slowly decrease the amount of avoidance and increase the amount of pressing. Remember, the shock does come at the end of the tone. So they can basically time out the interval and increase the amount of food that they're receiving. So at the end, they're, they're, they're uh, avoiding about the same amount as they're pressing. And there's a video of that shown below here. So the light is off, the tone is off. And now they turn on together, the tone and the light. 
so he's pressing very fast. He has a, he has a short time now to retrieve as much food as he can. And that's it. Now he's on the platform, again, waiting for the end of the tunnel. Even though he's a bit conflicted there. All right, tone is off. And now he can go back to the bar. Now, the majority of these animals do this, this what we call this timing behavior. But a small percentage, about 10% of the animals, uh, show a different, a different kind of response. They actually press, they avoid less and press more. So as if they, they're not concerned about the, uh, the, the, the shock. So we call these food preferring animals. And another subgroup here um, avoids almost entirely and, uh, and, and presses not at all. So these are platform preferring animals. So these two subgroups, uh, basically there are three different subgroups of responses in this conflict task. And interestingly, um, this, this conflict induces some change in, in their responses. And we're using now uh, CFOS and then later optogenetics to modulate these different subtypes. We've, all, we've also been using this task to model obsessive compulsive uh, compulsions. Many OCD compulsions represent, can be thought of as representing avoidance of perceived threats. So for example, hand washing, repetitive hand washing to avoid infection or disease. Now, there's a treatment for OCD that is called exposure with response prevention, or ERP. The person is taken and exposed to their stimulus, in this case, if, if it's infection or, or, or uh, um, germs, and maybe they touch a toilet seat, and then they're prevented from washing their hands for a period of time. The thought here is to actually extinguish this compulsive behavior. So we could modify our task to, to address this so we, have, we can condition the animals to go on the platform. Then we can extinguish over a number of days but by putting in a barrier, a plexiglass barrier, so that the animal cannot go on the platform. It can see it, but it can't go on. Then we remove the barrier and then ask, do they go on the platform or not, even though they've extinguished their, their fear responses. So we call this extinction with response prevention. So again, they get the conditioning, then three days of uh, extinction training with the barrier present, and then we remove the barrier. And what you see here is that the majority of the animals uh, shown in green here do not go on the platform. In other words, they stay by the food bar when the tone is on and they've learned their extinction. But a small percentage, about 25%, still go on the platform despite the extinction. We look at those animals that shown in pink here, and during the extinction with this, uh, phase, they actually show elevated freezing levels. So they seem to be more afraid um, in the presence of the barrier. In other words, more, more afraid of the fact that they can't mount the, the platform. Now, we can, we can reverse this persistent avoidance uh, with two different manipulations. One is an activation of the lateral orbital frontal cortex. Here's Musimol in the lateral orbital uh, area. And in animals that showed, in animals that showed the persistent avoidance, they now uh, do no longer show the persistent avoidance. Similarly, deep brain stimulation, a high frequency stimulation of the internal capsule or the nucleus accumbens internal capsule area in the, in the rat. Again, during the extinction training, they extinguish normally, uh, but it removes or eliminates the persistent avoidance shown at test. Now, interestingly, the, the condition freezing did not change in these animals. So these manipulations don't reduce fear. They just reduce the avoidance. And it suggests that the lateral orbital input to the rostral prelimbic cortex may be important in gating or modulating avoidance after extinction and after this, this situation. Another way to think about it is that these inputs may help to devalue the, uh, the platform after extinction.
And this may be a problem in OCD is that, that the, the platform is not devalued by extinction. Another uh, experiment with this task has been done by another postdoc in the lab, Fredison Martinez Rivera. Um, he's asked if the amount of conditioning, the extent of conditioning training affects the persistent avoidance. So he has two groups, one that's trained at eight days and one that's trained at 20 days, a, a very prolonged conditioning. Both groups learn the avoidance task and uh, reduce their freezing. But then they're put into the extinction response prevention um, and then given a test. And we notice is something very interesting that across the four days of extinction training, the 20-day uh, group, they start off the same, but they have trouble extinguishing their condition freezing responses like the eight-day group does. So in other words, they seem to maintain an elevated fear response uh, uh, during extinction. And then when they're tested without the barrier, they do show increased avoidance, but not increased fear, because presumably this avoidance they're doing is, is removing the, the fear that they have. So again, this may be related to obsessive compulsive disorder in the sense that um, this prolonged or habitual expression of the, of the compulsions can then um, uh, exacerbate um, this kind of dependence on the, on the compulsion to reduce fear. So we're now using optogenetics to manipulate these circuits to, to move uh, the rats from one group to another. So summarizing, um, the extinction, the expression of, of, of the avoidance, the, the amygdala gives tone information to the gastropelomic cortex. Gastropelomic then uh, projects to ventral striatum, which then projects to substantia nigra reticulata to mediate these avoidance responses. Now in extinction, the inflammatory cortex can inhibit either at the level of the amygdala or at the level of the striatum, we believe, uh, to reduce the avoidance. It depends on inputs from ventral hippocampus to both prelimbic and inflammatory using this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we think the lateral orbital input to rostral prelumbic is important in gating the value uh, after extinction of the avoidance. And we're particularly interested now in studying these, uh, the interaction of these different inputs using optogenetic techniques to study how do these inputs interact in the rostral prelumbic cortex to mediate and you know, control avoidance. Okay, there's human homologs of, of rodent prelimbic and inflimbic cortex. Uh, based on fear conditioning, the, the prelimbic cortex is thought to uh, be the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, and the inflimbic is thought to be homologous to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. This is based on uh, years of data in fear conditioning and extinction. Now, human studies of avoidance are, are rare, uh, and they're just beginning to, to be done. This is work from Daniela Schiller looking at um, a shuttle avoidance task where the subject is asked to keep moving that green dot from one side to another, or they have to learn that they, they're not told, they have to learn that if they keep shuttling it back and forth, they'll, they'll prevent a shock. If they don't, they will get a shock to their fingers. Now she scans these people in the MRI, it shows that, that the, when they're doing this avoidance response, there's an increase in activity in the, in the striatum. In addition, uh, when they're doing the avoidance task, there is an increase in or correlated activity between the um, most rostral part of the, of the prefrontal cortex and the caudate nucleus, and a slightly more caudal part of this anterior cingulate and the amygdala. So we think it is this, this it's interesting, this rostral area is, uh, is, is coordinating with the striatum in avoidance. And recent work from Mohammed Malad's group has shown in human subjects with, with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, using the PET FDG to look at resting activity, he finds that it's really this most rostral area that's correlated with the avoidance symptoms in these patients. So again, in both of these studies are indicating there's something uh, very important about this more rostral anterior cingulate area 
in mediating or modulating avoidance. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the talk. Here's the great people that I work with in Puerto Rico, the uh, graduate students and postdocs that I've already pointed out in the talk. But in particular, I'd like to just point out again a postdoc, Fabricio Delonte, who really started optogenetics in Puerto Rico and is now uh, setting up his own lab at the uh, University of Texas in Houston. Uh, our work is supported by funding from the National Institutes of Mental Health um, and the National Science Foundation and also the, uh, our University of Puerto Rico. And I'd like to make a plug for a new exciting journal that I'm an associate editor at uh, called The Science of Learning. This is part of the Nature Partner Journals to try and integrate what we know about learning and memory with education. In other words, the field of education, what does neuroscience have to say to education and, and vice versa. So this is a, a good time to, to submit to this journal and uh, it a, it's a unique, has a unique mission. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for your informative presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions, simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Clark will answer as many questions as time permits. And with that, let's hop into uh, the questions. Dr. Cork, the first question of the day asks, do the same PVT neurons project to both the nucleus, acubens, and amygdala, or are they separate? Carbon-triculate neurons can turn on fear um, and uh, can turn on fear or, or turn off the, the feeding. Um, we have done some double labeling experiments and seen that, in fact, the, the majority of the projections that we're seeing, there are many more projections to the accumbens than to the uh, amygdala, which is consistent with, uh, with the, the published anatomical data. There are some double label neurons. So there are some neurons that project to both targets, but very, very few. And uh, those might be important in terms of both, uh, you know, manipulating at the same time, turning off the, the uh, uh, turning on the fear by projections to the amygdala at the same time as turning off the pressing through the projections to the accumbens. Uh, but mostly they are, they are not uh, bi bidirectionally projected. Thank you for your answer. Next question, uh, B, D, and F is also involved in both extinction, extinction of fear and extinction of avoidance. Are there any differences between the two? Another good question. Um, sure. Yeah, that it's, it's a good question. I think that the, the, there are some differences. We're interested in the differences. And one of the key ones is that we've looked at uh, BDNF in the extinction of, of fear. Again, it's important, it's necessary in the infralimbic cortex, but it's not important and it's not necessary in the prelimbic cortex. In avoidance, um, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's necessary in both structures, both the infralimbic and the prelimbic. So we think that the prelimbic cortex is so critical for the expression of the avoidance that it can be manipulated or modulated by BDNF, BDNFergic inputs, unlike fear conditioning, which does not depend on the prelimbic cortex for the expression of the, of the fear. Okay, next. Thank you for your answer. Um, our last question of the day asks, in the conflict, ta conflict task, you show different subtypes of rats based on their reaction to food fear conflict. Do these subtypes show any differences during the early phases of avoidance training? Um, Actually, uh, they show very few differences. So, so I, think, I think the question is, uh, they, in the conflict, they show these different subtypes, some that prefer the platform, some that prefer the avoidance, some that prefer the, the food. Um, 
we've looked during the conditioning phase and during the conditioning training, we don't see any differences between these groups earlier in the training. So it suggests the interesting possibility that this difference between the subgroups develops or arises at the moment of the conflict. Uh, we can't, we're not able to predict which rats, uh, which rats will go into which subtype prior to conflict training. So it's a, it's a, it's a novel way of handling the conflict. They have different approaches to handling the conflict. I would like to once again thank Dr. Cork for his presentation. Do you have any final comments you'd like to leave with us today? Thank you again for the opportunity, and I'm happy to, to I'm happy to um, to answer any other questions or comments through email. Um, my email address is on the last slide, and uh, feel free to email me any questions about the work or comments, and I'm happy to to uh, to answer them. Thanks again. It's been our pleasure. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and thank LabRoots for today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that with uh, your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. This is Christina Mahalik with LabRoots and we'll see you here next time. Goodbye. <laughs>